Hey, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvelously well. I'm back with the great CJ Vance. Good to see you again. Good to see you. That was a blast the last one. I was we did. just going to say the same thing. I really enjoyed that. So I thought we would do two things. We promised in the last one we would do gear talk because right. when we come to great studios like this where there's lots of toys, people want to know why you have it, what you use it for, mm -hmm. all that kind of fun stuff. But we were talking about the record you're making at the moment. So I'd like to actually ask ah. you about that. Well, I'm only doing it because there's no other work. So I got called from this Derek Smalls guy. <laughs> and uh, evidently he cashed in his 401k and he's spending the whole thing on this ridiculous record. Nice. And uh, it's been 10 months we've been working on this thing. Fantastic. A labor of love. But uh, there's some really good songs in it, but we've got a ton of guest stars. When I say a ton of guest stars, it's insane. Yeah, it is pretty everybody insane. wants to play on it. Everybody I've called says, you know. Can I put some acoustic on one of the tracks? No. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there's been some great people that have called that have wanted to play. <laughs> uh, am I name dropping now? Is that no, no. That, yeah, tell me. Cause oh, I... let's name drop. Well, we've got some good guitar players. You have some wonderful guitar Yeah, players. we've got uh, Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, Dweezil Zappa, Phil X, Richard Thompson. Richard Thompson. Richard wonderful. Thompson. That, nice. He was playing on that end that I just played you. Oh, really? Yeah, he's, he's a sneaky player, man. Yeah, he's great. Uh, Steve Lukather. Lukather's amazing. Uh, Danny Korchmar. Wonderful. Ridiculous. He came in with Russ Kunkel. Because Danny and Russ, which most people don't know, were with the original Spinal Tap band. I didn't know And that. they are in the movie playing the uh, 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 Give Me Some Money. Oh, right. Right. Give me some money. Yeah, so I brought them in as a unit, the two of them, and put, that was our rhythm section for that. Right. But uh, we had another song that started sounding a little, I put some, I did a Steely Dan horn arrangement and uh, brought in the Snarky Puppy horns. Incredible. Ridiculous. And we thought, I wonder if Donald Fagan would sing in this record. And Harry's like, I, I don't think he will, but he sent it to him and he insisted on singing on the record, sent this stack of harmonies, beautifully done, amazing. You played it to me last time. It's amazing. <sighs> yeah, I think so too. It's, I mean, he just put the, the cherry on top. So David Crosby came and sang. Jane Lynch was here yesterday doing her crazy shit. And uh, uh, we had Chad Smith and Jim Keltner Keltner, playing yeah. at the same time. Greg Bissonette, uh, Amazing. Todd Zuckerman, uh, boy, Taylor Hawkins. Taylor Hawkins. When you start forgetting people like that, that shows what a ridiculous record is. Paul Schaefer is on a track. Wadi Wachtel. Wadi's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just, it's Peter Frampton. Oh, that was the one you talked about. Hello. That's fantastic. Yeah. 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 Rick Wakeman. Oh. What? So For you, bad. that must be pretty amazing to have. It was surreal. I actually haven't processed it yet. Yeah. You know, just the emails back and forth, mm -hmm. having the files show up. Yeah, here's Rick's parts, and I'm dragging them into logic, going, these are Rick Wakeman. Oh my God. <laughs> Thinking back when I would have probably sawed all my toes off for that opportunity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you know, that's a that's an interesting thing to to bring up here. Uh, that sense of knowing where you came from and that gratitude uh, and knowing your path, I think is really important. I don't think I would have felt that as much years ago. So I think there's something to getting older and more self-aware and I'm able to kind of enjoy this one a lot more than other ones, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So. I definitely find as I get older, I love the stuff that I love more. If I love it, I love it. <clears throat> it so. means you were right when you were 16, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm so surprised I listened to stuff when I was listening, uh, listened when I was 12 and these notes used to bother me. Oh, why'd they leave that on the record? It's out of tune. I put, it was a Blood, Sweat, and Tears track, and I put it on the other day, and I thought, here comes that note that's out of tune. And I mean, it's barely out of tune. So I had the same ears when I was 12. You don't quite know how to intellectualize, intellectualize it, but uh, you know, you gotta trust those ears, so I think you're validating that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's one heck of a 10-month ride. Yeah, it's been great. And it, you know, I, I, I do a lot of projects that are, uh, I kind of call my business a boutique business. Uh, I deal directly with the artist, like for instance, the Christopher Guest movies. It's really Chris and I sitting in a room and there's no infestation from any, you know, 
emails coming from up there, people that don't executive know, producers that don't know what the hell they're talking about, you know. And uh, I'm just kind of allergic to that. The, the record I did with Toto, there was no label infestation on that. It was just us in a room. So I prefer that kind of budget stuff. Once you get into those bigger records uh, or bigger movies, for that matter, you know, it's 50 emails a day of that stuff. It's just not not my scene. Absolutely. I envy the guys that can handle that, but it's not my scene. Well, they probably have their lawyer and their manager <coughs> and everything else do a lot of the conversations as well. Sure. This way you get to call, talk directly to creative people. Yeah, it's, that's why I said boutique. Mm -hmm. So anyway. That's wonderful. Yeah. I'm quite envious. There's a, there's a lot of people there I'd put in my top ten. Jim Keltner is just... Yeah. What a player. So what was the dynamic between him and Chad? How did they work together? You know, it's interesting the way I pictured it because I'm... I'm always been a big Almond Brothers fan and uh, with Butch and J-Mo and sometimes they would pan them out and do an equal energy they're both playing a great group that's what I had pictured but then I showed up and Jim had brought this little kit to complement Chad's kit nice. which means I can't pan them out because this side's not going to have and Jim's picturing this on top of each other and so I said, whatever you're yeah, into. Yeah, you're thinking Jim Go. Yeah. And Chad's just killing it. Chad's just, just you know, it's like he's going to the electric chair. And his, yeah. Everything he plays is so ridiculous. He's one of the most underrated drummers on the planet. I, I did three to six Love months Chad. of pre-production with the Chili Peppers on Californication, ah. just sitting in a room. Wow. Documenting everything. Well, then you know more than I do. Probably. Oh, yeah, they would. No, not more than you, but they would just jam a groove for three hours. <laughs> but, I mean, he can play every style. Yeah. And he's a great funk drummer. Great. Hits him hard. So anyway, he laid down, he started getting this groove going. Like, nice. And Keltner started doing his little Norton thing where he's getting ready to hit something. He starts banging and he builds this thing that goes with Chad's thing. And they jammed for, I don't know, 30 minutes, 40 nice. minutes, just, just keeping this beat going. And it was... Uh, it was uh, back to the garage band, you know what I mean? It got Magical. Just two drummers just having fun. And that's been the theme, by the way, of this whole record. Everyone I've talked to, just have fun. That's all I want. So what are you up to next? You're going to go and do some strings. Yeah, we're doing orchestra on six songs. Nice. Uh, this is, I mean, this is a really fun project. It's really deep musically. I'm really getting to pull a, a lot of my roots out. There's some Jethro Tull. You know, there's some Quadrophenia, there's some, uh, like you said, Zappa, uh, Deep Purple. I'm a huge Deep Purple fan, so being able to pull in all this stuff. Yeah, it's amazing. These references. Um, well, they all, but yeah, go ahead. They all blend. I mean, like, yeah. if you were a Zappa fan, you kind of like Deep Purple and you like, you know, you like right. all of these stuff. It's so uh, I started doing these or orchestral parts on top of some of the songs for, there's one where he laments the, well, I don't want to give it a giveaway, but it, it's just a lamenting song. And uh, I did this orchestral stuff on it, and uh, we went down to Australia uh, last June, exactly a year ago this week, and we got a tour of the Sydney Opera House. And it was a private tour, and we had the uh, the director of entertainment there, and he said, so what are you guys working on? And, you know, well, we're doing this record, and yeah, well, is it something you want to bring here? And I said, well, yeah, you know, actually, I'm doing some orchestral stuff on it. He goes, well, you got to come and play the Opera House. October 12th, 13th, 14th, we're debuting the record at the uh, Sydney Opera House. Wow. With the Sydney Philharmonic. So working backwards, we realized we had to record real orchestra on the record. So we're, uh, we're doing that next week uh, with the Budapest Symphony. Beautiful. Online which would be my first time doing that, but it's, uh, they've come highly recommended and uh, uh, I'm way into the process. Wonderful. You know, they really they really want to be there and do it. And yeah, so. That would be amazing. Yeah, about 75 pieces. Sheiks. So, yeah. That's, yeah. That's a huge orchestra. Yeah, well, it's the loudest band in the world, so <laughs> it, it better be, right? All right, so what is this? Oh, this is uh, this is Derek's personal bass preamp. He's is it very really? picky. He's very picky about his sound because it has to have big bottom. Big bottom. Yeah. You know, uh, talk about mud flaps. And you'll notice all the knobs 
or all the way up. That's his that's his custom setting. That's all eleven, presumably. Yeah. And this is even pulled out. This is a dual switch. So that's yeah, this twelve. Well, <laughs> we'll see about that. Uh, but this is called the Monique by Jewel. It's a handmade uh, tube uh, preamp, a base preamp. Huge, fat, giant. Love this thing. Love it. Beautiful. Uh, this is actually could possibly be my favorite piece of gear in the studio. Nice. Um, for the reason this is always in right mode uh, and it feels good. It's a, it's a tank, this Mackie. Uh, it's a tank. It's small. It's on the side. It's not taking up real estate in front of me because my keyboard's prominent, sure. right? Uh, and I can just always reach and I'm always riding shit. So someone does a vocal, I'm putting rides in right after it. So the whole process after that vocal, we're not hearing words jumping out. I get my rides done early. And it helps the mix process, I find. So this this is just an amazing piece of gear. I love this. So Wonderful. So you're, you're writing all your automation from this? Yeah, all of it. Great. Absolutely. Mute, solos, yeah. everything. Mute, solos, everything. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. What is this over here? Uh, this, is a, uh, this Apex stuff is really, really good stuff. And this is their uh, 500 rack. This is a stereo mic pre. And this is what I use when I bring in my vintage, uh, if I pull a vintage keyboard in here, yep. I come right in here. This thing sounds amazing. It's a great way to bring in stereo keyboards. Uh, we were talking, you were just about to talk about this. The These Apex channels are amazing. Now this yep. one here, this master voice channel yep. is, it's just, it's got the, it's the tube preamp with the compressor, <coughs> with the gate, with the de and then it's got their big bottom deal <laughs> and their oral exciter. And it literally is called big bottom. It is called big bottom. And, uh, <laughs> But it it's really is a great way to tune in instruments. It's a it works like a, a parametric EQ in a way. Yep. So it's the low end is the big bottom, the high end is the oral exciter. Um, great box. And then this one is the oral exciter. Yeah. Uh, I use this for acoustic guitar, and it's magical, magical on acoustic guitar. Great. Really, really beautiful. So, and then I got my reverbs, my hardware reverbs that I do use from time to time. We print those. We don't uh, keep them live. Are you using the profit anymore? Special occasions, you know, yeah. but less and less. Yeah. I got to say less and less. I, I love my soft synths. I do love them. Any go-to favorites for the soft synths? Well, Atmosphere, number one. Atmosphere. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. I know my way around it well. It's well made. I mean, I've got everything. All right, let's go over here. Yeah, this is I the... see at the top, you got the DMP plugged in. Were you using that on vocals? Yeah, that's what I use today. Uh, oh, I, beautiful. I, for vocals, I either use this DMP, the BAE, or Universal 6176, which is just juicy, beautiful. Gorgeous. But lately I've been using this, this BAE. Uh, so the 10 DC, I have that as well. Both uh, of them. Yeah, it just sounds amazing. It sounds amazing. And I have these, these two 1073s here. The, these are original Brent Averills. Again, I use these when I bring in in stereo information. Yeah. And the same thing with the ADL. Right. Sorry. I used to do my drums uh, using this whole setup and then with the Aphexes. I had them all right. in one rack and it was a drum setup. Sure. But as you'll see in the other room, I've changed right. my whole outlook on the whole thing. And I have to say, I am not married to any, I'm not attached to any technology or any vintage, right. anything. No, I if it can be new and it's not, doesn't have tubes in it and it sounds great and it's programmable, that's what I want to use. Right. I'm not attached to any you know, 1950s microphone that I have to use. Right. This new stuff, I've been mean, using this uh, Audio Technica 40, 4050 on vocals lately. First of all, it's the most beautiful mic I've ever seen. Yep. Look at this clip, the mic just pops in and out. Uh, this Smart. thing, what I like about this mic is it doesn't have a, uh, it sounds like a disc, it doesn't have a personality. Sure. It's just, it's just clean and clear. It doesn't have a bump here or a bump there. So when you stack, especially in the Toto records, we did all the backgrounds on the 5040. And when you're stacking 30 tracks of backgrounds and there's a bump yep. in the frequency range on every track. Yep. Gets a bit much. If I want a bump, I'll put a bump in it. That's yeah. kind of how I feel about it. So I really like working with modern technology, clean technology, and especially something that's not going to sound different. 30 minutes from now as it does now, which a lot of these old microphones do, so. So there's a lot of like outboard synth stuff here that is yeah. just not getting used anymore? No, you... I just don't turn it on because it's hot. So I, I use this stuff. I use the Jupiter 8 a lot. Oh, you do? This Waldorf, uh, I use all the time. This is my base synthesizer. That's all oh, I wow. use this for, period. Great. And nothing I own comes close, including my Mini Moog, wow. uh, my Oberheim, any of this stuff. This thing just is magic, magic synth. 
I just want to buy one now. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I trust him. And I, I got my uh, Dimension D down here. Which, oh, uh, amazing. Yeah. You know, I use that on background vocals or, or acoustic guitars. I've got the Trimo Chorus. Yeah. Um, rarely use that. I don't use Chorus much anymore. So The Super Jupiter? Super Jupiter with the programmer. Oh, wow. And that's, Do you, you know your way around that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, those yeah. I remember those things in studios and just be like, ah, I was terrified. Yeah. If well, you know where your way around it, they're incredible. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not that difficult, you know. I came up well, in, the, in the 80s and, <laughs> or actually the 70s, late 70s, and uh, you had to program. Yeah. You know, there were no presets, so you had to be good at it. Remember the uh, credits on the back of records? DX7 programming. DX7 programming, yeah. With Gary Lewenberger. And it was like the, the screen on DX7, for those of you that yeah. might know, was about this big. Yeah. And you had to program on this little tiny LCD screen. Well, put it this way. In the 80s, uh, we stayed up a lot. This is, uh, uh, it, basically, it's got... Uh, a, Three split synthesizers that yep. you can stack on top of each other. That's currently what I'm using live uh, uh, t as my organ keyboard. I always travel with a weighted keyboard, uh, an 88 key weighted for doing my piano yep. parts, and an organ type keyboard to do all the synth parts. And this has some nice uh, soft synth knobs on it and things like this. And I use vocoder a lot on a lot of stuff. So this VP770 is the best sounding vocoder I've used. But I just got a new one from Roland. Yeah, and I'm going to check out next week. Yeah, and I'll Wonderful. show you that in the other room. All right. This speaking of which, let's go in the other let's room. Let's go for a walk. Pretty much three sections here. This is obviously the drums. We've got the bass amp here, the bass station, and the guitar station. And then when we move over here, this is kind of the mechanical keyboard section. We've got the organ, the B3. We got the Wurlitzer, the Rhodes, mechanical instruments, and I put the Mini Moog on top. This is maybe a sixth of what I own. So I've, <laughs> there's really no way for me to put everything out that, that, that I have. But these are some of the all-stars here. Um, this, this is my favorite. I can The understand. Oberheim 4 voice is the fattest Mac Daddy. And basically, it's four independent synthesizers. Wow. And so what happens here, uh, like if you go to something like a Prophet 5, you're only seeing one synthesizer on, on top, one module. But there's uh, 16 inside. Same with the Jupiter 8. There's eight of these. So you're seeing only one oscillator, one envelope generator, you know, amplitude envelope generator. So, uh, you're only seeing one. Here, you're seeing all four of these have separate envelope generators and separate filters and separate oscillators. Oh, wow. So you set them, you're never going to get them exactly the same, you know? So when you play, you see this rotates. Boom, 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 boom. That's rotate mode. So what you get is two Oberheim expanders here. This combination is so giant, it's ridiculous. Wow. So I mean, it's basically like like the Matrix Twelve was one of my favorite synths, and this is two of those. So that I really love pulling those in there and panning those out. Either way, those are huge. The new RD two thousand killer piano. This is a great gig gig machine, as is. This new Dexabel, uh, they just sent me the new one to check out. And, I don't know uh, them. Yeah, oh, they're fabulous uh, controller. Another open, oh, the OB-1. Oh, the OB-1, yeah. This had the weird pitch wheel. Yeah. So. I've been looking for a new way to do drums in this room and, and also to capture this entire room. Let's say I got some of my awesome friends over, the sure. people that come in the studio. Yeah, you know, and I want to capture that sure. to be able to hit one button, have everybody sit down and just uh -huh. jam, and we can go. I don't want to be plugging shit in, getting levels or whatever. So, I looked at a lot of these uh, programmable mixers, and I thought about I'm going to get a stack of mic pre's and do that whole thing, get the API 500s, and the, sure. you know, go through all that and get them. And at the NAMM show, I saw this Roland M300 system, and I didn't think a thing about it. And the guy at the Roland said, you should, you should check one of these out. I don't think you're going to appreciate how good this thing sounds. So basically, uh, I'll take you to the, to the patch base first. This, uh, this is the S2416. This is their digital patch bay. The mic preamps are in the patch bay. So the mic preamps are basically this far from the mic connector. Nice. So the lack of wiring, everything being right there, you're not running 
150 feet of audio snake, you're running a Cat5 cable. So the converters in this thing are, they sound amazing to me. The mic priests sound amazing. Great. So you're able to stack these. Uh, I'll eventually have three of them. I have one in that room also. You stack these with, with patch bays. There's one for the uh, mechanical keyboards, the B3, the Rhodes, and the uh, Wurlitzer. And also these M48 personal mixers. I didn't appreciate how cool these things are. So from this mixer, which I'll take you in the other control room, control room B, uh, you can send pairs, 16 pairs of, of buses of whatever you want. Sure. And anybody can adjust them, all programmable per song, per whatever, you know, and uh, it has a, uh, a ambient mic that you can bring in the, if you're talking in the room. So I'm, I like everyone to have their earbuds in, sure. in here, virtual guitar amp for, just for live so we can, get the, we can capture the drums. And basically hit one button and it sounds like God in your headphones and Wonderful. everyone can just play. I, I no longer use my vocal booth because we're just doing vocals in the control room sure. right there. And I find it so superior because we don't use any talk back. Yeah. You don't have to keep pushing and holding it for the guy in the band that wants to talk and he didn't hear him. And, yeah. and plus you're putting someone out there all isolated by themselves when the rest of the band's in here or whatever. And so I've been doing all my guitar overdubs, uh, even cello, whatever, right in the control room. And it, it changed my life. Great. It really did. I really like it. Unless it's someone I want to talk about, then I'll put him in. <laughs> so what I did is I, I, I So thought, if I ever do an overdub and he doesn't put me in the room. Yeah, you'll know, you'll yeah. know what's happening. Yeah. So I thought, uh, where am I going to put that M300 mm -hmm. mixer to harness all this? And also I want to film some of this stuff. So I thought, wait a minute, I'm going to build a little Final Cut uh, AV room, M300 mixing room. So that's what I did with my vocal booth. Great. Right. So this thing is uh, deceptively small, as are the speakers. These, uh, these are ESI's new speakers. I am loving these little 5-inch these little uh, or 4-inch drivers with the sub down here. They sound so great being right in your face. I checked out a pair of these, and I said, these are going to be perfect for my control room. So you see, it's just real simple. But this is so deep. What is inside this is so deep. With all the effects, all the sands, all the buses, uh, all the trims, programmable. By the way, one thing I love about these, these digital patch base is it's programmable preamp game. Right? right? So you got a bunch of mic preamps out there. They're going to change. This way I can program. I could, bring in, uh, I could bring in Ed Cherney and have him get me a drum sound and save it. Right. I could bring in Al Schmidt and get a drum sound and save it and have, you know, programmable stuff. And also work on getting these mixes that are going to the musicians. Really get all that work done so it's all harnessed. Then this goes out from here uh, to a MADI converter. MADI, uh, 40 channels of audio right into Logic. Fantastic. To complete, to complete the loop. So anyway, I'm, I'm really excited about this. And I didn't expect to be able to get away with recording drums on something like this. Like, there's no way this can sound good compared to using the big racks of all the stuff, the Gucci mm -hmm. stuff we love with the, you know, with the, the limiters and everything like that. I got to tell you, man, so far, uh, I think we're going to just be able to use this. And, and Great. I'm really happy. I mean, the first two minutes I had drummer playing out there in two minutes, I'm like, this sounds like a great drum sound. Save. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. That's really cool. I became friends with John Good at uh, DW, and he's like, you don't have a drum kit in your studio? Oh, yeah, let's go look at the so, DW. So John says, no, 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 no. We got we to gotta get a drum kit going here. So First, we started with the, with the kick drum. He said, what kind of, I'm pretty picky about drums. And he said, what kind of uh, kick drum are you looking for? And I said, uh, I like the, 20, the snap of a 22. Yep. You know, the punchy 22 inch. But... Uh, but I like that bottom thing too, you know? Yeah. He built me a 23 inch prototype, this thing. Oh, wow. And it is just, it's just perfect. So I unpacked this kit from, this, from the factory and the tuning, everything was just nailed. <laughs> it's one of the best drum kits I've ever heard in my life. I mean, it's crazy. And drummers that have sat down and played this say the same thing. I'm not a drummer, I'm a guitar player, so. Yeah. But a lot. So anyway, but it's uh, Sitka Spruce, which is what you make 
Oh, that projects. Isn't that nice? I barely touched it. Get it again. Yeah. Yeah, was it? Beautiful. See the snare drum. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Huge sound for a little room. You can't believe it. Well, I, I, I put this in, this little bass trap thing. Yeah, it's a great idea. And it, it just... Beautiful. And then I stick a, a mono mic in the bathroom. <clears throat> and you let my friend P Cameron... He's yelling he, the wall. My, cat, my friend Cameron loves these as well. Oh, my God. These audio technical yeah. sound mics? He's freaking are out you, about Are it. you kidding me? Yeah, he freaks out about them. And look at, the, look at the lack of stands. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I a lot of people stands here. This. My kick isn't even plugged in. Then I have the, uh, the DW Moon mic. This is my sub mic. Oh, nice. I didn't know that. I haven't seen that and, yet. And I switched to all Audio-Technica stuff, man. You know, I started putting one one here, one there, and I'm like, this stuff sounds great. Yeah, I love, a lot these of my... Little, these little condensers. Yeah, a lot of people moving little, to these are great. The little AT condensers. Oh, really? Oh, my God. These things sound beautiful. Look at that little beautiful little mic. Yeah, it is. Really great. I'm loving what Audio-Technica is doing. And they're, they're a great company. And you know that's that's something that uh, from years of working in this business, I'm going to 30 NAM shows, I think 31 at this point. Right. Um, I've gotten to know so many of these manufacturers, and they're so much a part of the tribe. Sure. They're such great people, and they really care about the music that's being made. So, I I think it's important to have ties with companies and, and you know have suggestions and help. And uh, Audio Technica just was one company uh, I met Roxanne Ricks. She's uh, she's deals with the artists there, and she was just a conduit into what they're working on. And now I can call and say, here's what I'm trying to do. And they say, oh, you've got to try the blah, 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 blah. So right. same thing with my drum company. You know, It's just great to have the real people that are building the shit. You know, my contacts at Roland that I've known for 25 years. That's wonderful. That, uh, I, was, out, so. I, know, I hear what you're saying. I feel like... 20, 30 years ago, there was a kind of us against them mentality between yes. all of the, yeah. the instrument manufacturers, the band, the label, the agent. Now it's all just one big industry. We're all in the same industry. Now. Well, I think a part of it is us moving too, because I think when we started, you know, I'm just going to be a musician. I'm not going to be you know, a business guy. Yeah. Guess what? You're the head of marketing. Yeah. You're the head of, you know, there's so much business we have to do. And yeah. I think after doing that for 20 years or whatever, you start realizing that it's not really disassociated with what we do. It is, is it, the more you know about it, the more empowering it is. Mm -hmm. And to push that away. So anyway, these guys have all been so great about uh, helping put this thing together. And uh, I'm really, really happy right now. Hey, really I've seen you got a couple of Luke guitars. <laughs> I've got some Lukey guitars here. Oh, I like these. I think that's an E flat one. Is it, I like it. Yeah, these are great. Yeah. Oh, this is rosewood. It's heavy, but yeah. There's Jeff Baxter's uh, baritone. Look at that. Look that, at that I, ugly I was wondering thing. Isn't that ugly? It's so ugly. I that love it. It's so ugly that it's beautiful. Yeah. I, I, I was saying that when I first walked in. It's just so. It's just oh, a. It's heavy. It's got some real estate. Oh yeah. I love doing berry guitar. But. Uh, this is all a preamble to the, the nerve center of the entire studio, for me, that just is what everything's centered around, is basically the, the accordions. That's uh, <laughs> what, I'm, what we're working towards here. So uh, I was wondering when we were going to get to This is my them. first uh, endorsement I ever had was with Veltmeister. So uh, I was working with Joe Cocker, and we did a, uh, we did a song called Nublier Jamais. Mm -hmm. It means never forget, and it was this French lyric that was the only thing that was French was those two words and I said hey we got to put an accordion on that and he said will you play accordion I'm like oh yeah well, not really but uh, so I brought in this accordion my mom had bought me on eBay she just because my mom was a really good accordionist and uh, so I brought in this beat up accordion and I played it and it was just perfectly out of tune went on the record this thing became a giant hit so now well I mean by the way uh, so Okay, punch. I, I couldn't. I couldn't get any of that going. So we punched it in, with Chris Lord Algae, and the record came out. It was a huge hit. So now, I become musical director of the next tour. I got to play it on stage, walking out and standing next to Joe Cocker, accordion. So I learned how to play accordion. 
Nice. Yeah. Weltmeister. 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 You will like it. Let me grab one more thing. Yeah, here. please. So uh, we're working on the Derek Smalls record, yep. and I was telling you that uh, uh, Danny Korchmar and Russ Conkle played on "Give Me Some Money" in the movie. Danny's actually singing in that in that scene. If you look, Danny's on the mic. Give me some, some money. money. So. Derek decided he wanted to do a tribute to that song, but really where that would look at where he is in life now. Sure. So the name of the new song is called Give Me Some More Money. <laughs> so I agreed. That's I kind of feel that way too. So let's let's sure. do that song. So give me some more money. That's got Paul Schaefer and Wadi Wachtel and uh, Jim Keltner and that's it. But I said, Derek, you need a special bass. Cool. Because we did there's there's some high parts and whatever. So uh, he had this built. <laughs> so this is a very special. Uh, Who made this? I actually don't know. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were fifth apart. <laughs> nice. That's Relevant. Insane. Relevant. Relevant. There you go. Give me some more money. Give me some more money. Anyway, <laughs> now you know the whole truth. So this room is uh, the, just the, the entrance. Anyway, I like to spin vinyl in here, and uh, I got this nice denim receiver. And so I had these nice JBLs in here, and uh, I was talking to the guys at IK Multimedia, and they said, you got to check out our new speakers. And I said, oh, okay, great. I'm kind of okay with speakers, you know. I said, no, this would be a nice reference. That's why I like to have different speakers, so we're, you know, obviously reference that. So these little IKs, Look at these things. No subwoofer. These things are mind blowing. They're mind blowing. Bluetooth. They got little stands that fold out to stack them. Uh, there's external input for whatever. And then on top of it all, it's got this little travel case. I mean, they blew me away. Absolutely blew me away. The, the, the guys at IK are great. Yeah. And that's back to what I was talking about. So many of these manufacturers are so cool. Yeah. And they're so into it and they're, they're there to help. You know, so. Yeah. No, it's been a great time. And I hope uh, everybody watching this finds something that is either fun or educational or turn it off. <laughs> When's the album come out? Uh, I think we're looking at Oct October. Great. Which is another thing I was saying. There's no pressure on this. When the record's done, that's when we are going to move into artwork and, you know, marketing. We have no label right now. We're going to wait till the record's done to do that. So I really love working like that. Great. It's really, really yeah. great. It's amazing. You just yep. get to make amazing music. Make your own schedule. Do stuff as it comes. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thanks ever so much. Thank you. Thank you. As ever, please leave a bunch of comments and questions below and have a marvelous time recording and mixing.